Chair of the Hydrographic Society in Scotland and I'd like to welcome you all to our joint evening event. Uh, this is our joint Hydrographic Society in Scotland and Norwegian Offshore Survey and Positioning Forum uh, joint evening event and this evening is entitled The Next Steps in UXO Survey Technology and Techniques. Uh, we've got three um, excellent uh, presenters lined up for you this evening. Um, our first presenter is uh, Chris Armand. Uh, he's Business Development Man Manager at Pangeo Subsea. Uh, Chris is a senior member of the Pangeo Subsea commercial team, where he's responsible for the company's global business development activities across the offshore renewables, oil and gas, civil engineering and defence markets. He's previously worked for a number of market leading survey companies where he held commercial roles and prior to this as a marine geophysic geophysicist, that's easy for you to say, uh, working on a data acquisition and working on data acquisition and analysis for offshore developments. Um, Sorry, the auto queue's broken this evening. Um, so I'd like to introduce Chris Armand, and his presentation this evening is entitled Detailed 3D Acoustic UXO Surveys to Reduce Target Visualization Requirements. Thank Hi there, you. Chris. Hi. Um, yeah, and uh, over to you. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for the intro. So yeah, uh, as Sam said, I'm uh, Chris Armand, Business Development Manager for Pangeo Subsea. Uh, and today, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the use of 3D acoustics to ultimately to mitigate the target visualization element of a UXO survey. So what we're going to be talking about, um, obviously, I'll, I'll do a very brief introduction to UXO surveys and, and sort of phases they break into. I appreciate we've got presentations from, say, Fugro uh, coming up where I appreciate they'll go into much more detail than I can. Um, obviously, then introduce you to the 3D technology itself. Um, where acoustics then look to aid the magnetic surveys, so obviously a, a, another complementary data set uh, to the magnetics, but then also where they can be applied as a standalone uh, data set. Uh, look at then how the, uh, the acoustic data is acquired, sort of survey methodologies, um, how it's then used to determine if an object may be debris, potential UXO, or to prove that the uh, magnetic target is a false positive. And I've just got one slide right at the end about non-ferrous UXO surveys. I appreciate it's a very niche requirement, but it's still obviously part of the UXO survey um, remit. So just very briefly touching on the sort of phases uh, of UXO surveys, but really I want to show this just to paint a picture of the sort of scale of UXO surveys and, and, and the duration of the entire um, life cycle of the UXO element of the development. Phase one, clearly desktop study, just to find out what is potentially down there, what was dropped in the vicinity, what sort of targets you're looking at. Phase two, obviously, once you've got that information, going out, collecting your um, seabed and then magnetic subseabed data. Obviously, to then produce your target listing, magnetic surveys typically come up with quite a large survey um, target listing. Obviously, it's, it's, it's identifying everything which is magnetic, essentially. Um, phase three, going out and doing um, investigation, um, digging it up taking a look with your ROV, what it is. Phase four, obviously, um, disposal, removal of debris, removal of, of munitions. And phase five, your, your elapsed certificate. You're good to go. You can go build your uh, UN farm. Just put a few uh, images there. This is a, um, a magnetic anomaly uh, map of a wind farm development just to show really the size of some of these issues. And obviously this is just a zoomed in section of the wider wind farm. Um, the target listings can be in the thousands of targets when you come into a, to a wind farm development. And obviously those targets represent everything that's ferrous from debris to potential munitions. You can obviously track a cable or a pipeline uh, along your site as well. Um, at the moment, the vast majority of these targets will be dug up by an ROV, so excavating it, taking a look at it visually, 
to find out that over 90% of which is, is debris, you could have left that in situ. Um, the ID and C phase of the UXO survey is obviously typically run into the several months when you've got thousands of targets uh, to, to go and debury. So really what we're going to look at here is then using 3D acoustic data to remove as much of those as possible. So just an introduction to the technology um, obviously I represent, so Pangeo Subsea, um, we have developed a 3D chirp system called the Subbottom Imager. Uh, what the Subbottom Imager produces is a continuous high resolution 3D acoustic image below the seabed. So as you're surveying a longer track, um, it's producing a single 3D volume um, along that track. It's all real-time data, so as you're surveying along your survey line, the data is being visualized live um, on screen. Uh, being a 3D system, we um, acquire and process the data into cubes, which we call voxels, and that goes down to a five-centimeter resolution. For the seabed, you're achieving a five-meter footprint, and then penetration is dependent on lithologies, give or take, it is a very typical penetration is five meters the locally it might be slightly less um, or more and um, what the technology does is you, you obviously you, by using acoustics you're measuring the acoustic impedance so you're going from one material say your natural seabed sand to then hitting a a, um, a target with a different impedance um, it detects that that boundary so that enables it to image everything, including obviously ferrous, so munitions, pipelines, cables, but then also non-ferrous objects, so boulders, non-ferrous UXO, or buried concrete mattressing. Uh, and then being a, uh, an acoustic system, it can be deployed on a variety of platforms. This is where the, uh, the acoustic data really comes into play. So I'll split them out there. At the top, you've got your, um, your standard magnetic UXO survey. Uh, so you've done your UXO survey here. Um, then you're sending out the ID and C vessel to obviously go debury them. What, using the acoustics, is if you add them into your ID and C phase, uh, you're, you're obviously acquiring a bit more survey up front but really to then obviously reduce that target listing. And secondly, that we'll touch on at the end is then the non-ferrous element where actually the acoustics is used as a standalone um, data set. So uh, in case one, it, it's a data set to, uh, yeah, to accompany and complement all the data you've already acquired. And in phase two, the non-ferrous is a standalone data set. On the survey methodology, <clears throat> obviously when you're targeting known um, magnetic anomalies, um, you focus the, the, the survey in a box around that target. Um, and what ultimately you're looking for is to be able to determine the, the target shape, the dimensions, and compare the acoustic uh, dimensions to those of expected munitions. Um, clearly now the methodology changes somewhat depending on the developer, how they want to go about it, or the, um, the UXO risk analysis or then the survey contracts themselves. But give or take, it's genuinely a box, five by five meters, 10 by 10 meters centered on the magnetic target. Um, and then we would look to acquire, so you, ultimately you want 200% coverage. How many lines that takes? three, four, five, it just depends on positional accuracy. Um, and, and so where that target is, obviously if it's dead center, um, you'll find it in two, and if it's off track, then maybe um, a third or fourth line. Number of targets is completely beholden really on speed of survey from the ROV, but then also um, the distribution, uh, lateral distribution of the targets. If you've got targets within 10, 15, 20 meters, obviously it's, it's much quicker. Uh, but anywhere from 10, 20 targets a day is quite typical. All that data is then given to the onboard um, EOD specialist. They can review the acoustic images and then ultimately determine if that target is still of interest or not. So just give you some examples now of anomalies which are uh, indicative of UXO. So obviously they've got, um, I guess, a, they, they've got a magnetic anomaly so you know where they are from the magnetics but then also following the acoustic survey 
they meet the, the dimensions of the shape of uh, expected munitions. So just a few examples here. And obviously from the acoustics, you can, um, you can see the sort of elliptical shape and you can see the, the, the measurements as well and how they measured up to the recovered object. What I would say is obviously I'm talking about 3D acoustics, but you can't really show 3D data in a presentation. So these are just screen grabs, um, 2D screen grabs. So what you're doing is you're now looking top down through the seabed. So we slice through the seabed. You're now looking at the sort of plan view there. So clearly, yeah, very elliptical shape. Um, and then these tags obviously just indicative of, um, of recovered munitions. Comparing that then to the shape of objects, which are quite clearly from the acoustics debris. Um, so up to this point, you would have only had the magnetic signature. You, you know there's definitely something ferrous there. And prior to the acoustic survey, you would have spent several hours um, deburying that target to find, in this case, clumps of uh, wire or chain. Uh, just a few more examples, but it's obviously very clear um, what the uh, magnetics have detected isn't a potential munition. That said, it is astonishing what's been thrown over the side of boats over many years. So on occasions, there are still obviously targets which uh, are the shape and dimensions of munitions, but clearly then don't represent munitions. In this case, it's from those uh, a gas canister that you use to make your lager nice and fizzy. The third, I guess, um, reduction here. So we've gone through um, targets which are very clearly munition or indicative of munitions, so shapes uh, and, and dimensions. Ones that are quite clearly not. And then the third way that the acoustic could then, I guess, um, reduce that target listing is, um, I guess, what you would call from the magnetic data uh, false positive. So this is a magnetic signature, which then doesn't actually represent a, um, a target. So, um, yeah, it, it's very clear, obviously, when you're reviewing the acoustic data, as you can see here, again, this is the top down view. So we've slashed through the seabed and you're now looking. So that's the, the five metre footprint there. And that's the survey track, I guess, heading across screen. Um, so when we're reviewing the acoustic data at the location of a known magnetic target, obviously, we, we are taking these slices at, at 10 centimetre intervals through the seabed. Um, and it's very obvious when, in this case, there is no target present. Uh, again, we would still do the 200% um, coverage just to make sure that it's not been missed off a line. Um, and I guess the, the reasons why the, you, you might get a false positive in the magnetic data, um, uh, which doesn't represent uh, a munition, is so one is it's it's false yeah it's an actual false positive so it's just um, a false reading uh, identified in the magnetic data, or the second one is that the obviously the, there was a ferrous um, object there um, at some point in time which is clearly corroded away so the the actual ferrous signal is still there you still got the 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 magnetized components but they essentially disintegrated, they've corroded into the fact that they're just part of the sea right now. And then just, um, yeah, touching really on, on the last slide here is then the non-ferrous UXO survey. So all the methodologies that we've just talked about going out and acquiring your magnetic data, um, that is to obviously acquire data over a large, um, footprint of the seabed but what that won't necessarily tell you is if there um, are non-ferrous targets which wouldn't necessarily so that's a target that doesn't have a ferrous content um, within the second world war you had uh, munitions LMA LMB mines so these were aluminium case munitions um, I believe um, Google can probably um, talk in, in greater detail to this as well who, who've also obviously got a lot of experience in this uh, in this section. So being that it's an acoustic system, it's measuring the impedance. So if the casing is still intact, say this uh, image here, you'll still image the um, exterior. If it's 
heavily corroded, so the casing isn't really intact, then you'll be imaging, in this case, uh, the inner component. So, um, yeah, with non-ferrous surveys, um, typically they're over much smaller areas, much more targeted areas. Um, but then I guess you would move away from an ROV and, and onto a sort of a towed platform as well. So, um, yeah, ultimately that's um, it for the acoustics, really just demonstrating how you would A, acquire the, the data and then B, hopefully the examples that I showed you was, um, yeah, very obvious um, how the acoustics is then used to, to visualize and ultimately reduce that target listing. So at the end of the day, a little bit more survey to reduce the overall time in field. And that's me. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. That was really interesting. Um, I've, uh, I've, I mean, you'll have to excuse my ignorance uh, with this, but uh, it's not something I, I know very much about, and so will everybody else, as a matter of fact. Um, that, that was really quite clear and interesting. Um, so you were talking about ferrous and non-ferrous targets. Do you kind of get, obviously, well, you get most of ferrous targets, do you? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, the vast, vast majority of UXO surveys are, are going out there to, to locate ferrous. And that's what the um, standard survey practices are, is, is to go out and detect um, the yeah, ferrous. Yeah. So is there so it's a low percentage of non ferrous like aluminium t aluminium targets that you'll detect? Yeah, and, and where these um, non ferrous munitions were placed are, are quite well documented. So the, the locations of these munitions, the non ferrous munitions are relatively known, whereas obviously non ferrous munitions being the, the prevalent one used during conflicts were, were jettisoned or, or dropped or fired everywhere. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then you're 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 kind of uh, is it is it an automated process for detecting the targets? No, or, unfortunately, or not yet. Progress? No, so the the data is still gone through through um, by trained geophysicists really to 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 identify uh, yeah anomalies that which are representative. Um, once so the once the acoustic survey has been carried out, obviously you've got that target. We you've imaged it, you've got the shapes, dimensions, and then that target is still then passed on to what's called the EOD, um, personnel offshore. So then it's still uh, a manual process to, to obviously check it. And it's the EOD on board who then determines if that target does or does not represent UX. Mm, okay. Okay. And, and, and um, you know, in, in comparison to kind of say five years ago, how much of a, how much of a, uh, advancement in in this type of technology has there been would you say from you know from your perspective as a as a professional in the field sure yeah so um i guess with uh, speaking on pangeo subsea's behalf there's the the actual technology um hasn't changed all that much in recent years how we deploy it has but it's then the processing and and how you what or what you do with that data so really I mean, the, the technology was originally developed to image cables and pipelines. So then it's just taking that technology and how do you apply it to the UXO market and ultimately to, to, to try and benefit that. So, yeah, the majority of the advancements has been in our understanding of, of the UXO market and, and how you package the data to, to benefit the end user. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Got a, uh, got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, hi, Chris. Do you need further processing before you can get the cube data? Uh, no. So the um, all the data is visualized live on screen. Um, now, it does come in at 10 sets. So what we call, I guess, your the the, um, the raw data that comes in on screen is a 10 centimeter voxel. So we do, for UXO surveys, uh, do some additional processing to then get the, the 5 centimeter voxel. But for such a small area when it's three lines at 10 meters that's a matter of 10 minutes or so okay okay um and we have a question from cars uh would the sea kite then be able to combine magnetic and acoustic images in the same survey 
Correct, yeah. So Seakite is a Toad platform that, that Pangeo have developed um, alongside uh, Ivan. So we, we've housed the acoustics in there to be able to tow it at faster speeds. Um, yeah, ultimately, the, the benefit of that is that you can acquire the acoustics much faster, but then also you can take the acoustic survey and put it at the front end to, to join up the, the large scale magnetic survey so you can tow the magnetometers at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Chris. I think that's uh, that's it from our our audience uh, our audience members out there, and that was very interesting. And uh, we may have some more questions that come in later, so feel free, everybody, to keep asking um, Chris as many questions. Feel free to uh, bamboozle him if you can. Um, I did forget to mention that um, uh, we are asking questions of our uh presenters this evening via the comments uh via the comments in youtube and actually before we move on chris we'll keep you there because we've actually had a flurry in had a flurry <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll blame i'll blame my uh i'll blame my internet connection for the slow speed of it as opposed to our audience's slow typing speed <laughs> Okay, uh, so one from Walter here. Which parts of the world uh, slash locations is this type of work typically focused in? Is it global or restricted to a few high risk areas? I'd say it's definitely a global a global issue. Obviously, you've got um, the North Sea or Northwest Europe is 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 the focus of the majority of the industry just now. But I guess what's really driving um, the use of UXO services, more the size of survey footprints now. So with say the east coast of, of the USA now, the renewables market coming in, the size of the wind farms that you're putting in needs huge volumes of survey. And so it's the same in Taiwan. Obviously there's unfortunately been, been conflict globally, but it, it's really the size of the survey required which is now driving the locations of those requirements, if that makes sense. So, so the, yeah, yeah. So the, the size of the wind farm developments themselves has mm -hmm. increased significantly. Yeah. So it's the footprint, obviously mm. previously say that there's obviously um, oil and gas developments in Southeast Asia and, and, mm. and in the States as well. But when you're putting in a rig, it's a very small platform yeah, well, yeah. Um, for wind farms with the cables and the, the turbine locations. Yeah. So where do you find yourselves working mostly? Have you got a kind of a, a, a locale that you find yourself in most often? Yeah, those obviously Northwest Europe is, is where I guess most companies, uh, UXO yeah. surveys are focused just now. Um, the Eastern Seaboard of the States is definitely picking up. There's, there's quite a number of UXO surveys commencing or soon to commence there. And they're exactly the same in Taiwan as well, yeah. Mm, okay. Um, and we've got one from a question from uh, Hans Jorgen um what tow speeds can be achieved uh so it's an acoustic system so four knots um if you're towing obviously when it's deployed onto an rov it's limited by the rov speed okay uh, i've got another question from walter here who he was wondering about the us eastern seaboard and larger area surveys making it more important sure so i guess with yeah when with with the um renewables industry increasing the survey size requirements then clearly there's, there's there's a need then to to come up with innovations like using acoustics to to reduce that because now as you saw the the example i gave when you're developing a a wind farm the size of greater london then you, you're going to have tens of thousands potentially of magnetic mm -hmm. targets and and yeah the the id and c phase very typically three four five six months to, to have a boat in there dredging them all up. So wow. trying to come up with innovative ways of reducing that ultimately. Yeah, okay. Well, that was fantastic. Uh, thanks uh, thanks to all our uh, viewers for asking questions there and uh, keep them coming in if we've got any time at the end or feel free to uh, ask Chris yourself. <laughs> Inviting questions there for you. Thanks ever so much, Chris. And uh, I'll just move on to introduce our... Uh, our next um, presenter this evening. Um, our next presenter is uh, Matthew Kowalczyk.
Uh, he's the CEO of Ocean Floor Geophysics. His professional career includes leading and design team for automated vision systems for the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry, as well as successfully starting, growing and selling a company that developed multispectral sensor-based ore sorting technology and services for the mining industry. Since joining OFG, the companies continue to serve its original customers in seafloor mineral exploration projects and has expanded the business through close collaboration with its clients in the development and deployment of new marine robotic services, specialised electromagnetic sensors and technologies for seafloor mapping, asset integrity inspection and exploration. Um, okay. Um, Matthew's presentation this evening is entitled RM Hypermag, multi-vector gradiometer for UXO cable pipeline depth of and depth of and excuse me, shall I start that again? Multi-vector gradiometer for UXO cable and pipeline depth of burial. Um, bit too much of a mouthful for me there. I think. <laughs> yeah, I have been accused <laughs> of whiffling on occasionally. Apparently, I do that in type too. So. No, great. Thanks, Matthew. And uh, over to you. Great. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for having me. And I and I I, I love it when the guest before segues perfectly into uh, into the into the next uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, Mr. Almond's uh, comment there about uh, towing magnetometers. Um, you know, with with and, and pairing those with the uh, the sub bottom imager, uh, I think is a is a is a perfect um, uh, a perfect introduction. Um, that's that's what we want to that's what we want to be doing with RM Hypermag. So I'm going to go very briefly through the next uh, slide, but just to give you an idea, um, not so much from the commercial side, but just to show you kind of the evolution of of OFG. As we we did start in seafloor minerals, that's still a market we we serve. Um, and what's very interesting about seafloor minerals is I, I grew, up, grew up with a exploration geophysicist at the head of the table. Um, and you know, when I was younger and I, I actually until joining OFG, when I said geophysics, what I meant was electromagnetics, magnetics, potential fields, induced polarization, the, the kind of technologies that are widely applied in hard rock mineral exploration, copper, gold, uh, base metals. Um, and then I came to the, the marine minerals uh, industry in 2014, and I realized everybody was, when they said geophysics, they meant seismic or acoustics. So, of course, OFG deploys that and uses that, but, but the genesis of the company is really, um, actually, our, our first project was an electromagnetic system for mapping seafloor minerals. And we've progressed through that um, and deployed them on robotics systems, uh, which are vital to seafloor minerals exploration and that expertise of integrating uh, specialized sensors uh, deploying them on seafloor minerals um, has really been uh, how OFG has has grown uh, deploying deep water AUVs um, and and then developing things like our uh, integrated cathodic protection with an electric field sensor for non-contact CP I'm mentioning all these because they're actually all quite related um, <clears throat> and where I'm going to start is with not with hypermag, but with our self-compensating magnetometer. So this is a system that OFG uh, originally developed for ourselves for mineral exploration. Uh, it was a magnetometer that instead of towing it behind an AUV, you could put it inside the AUV. Now, if you compare that, say, to a um, you know Overhauser proton precession magnetometer, um, they are the, those types of total field magnetometers are much more sensitive. The problem is, is that once you start putting those onto, you know, very expensive AUVs, you're spending, you know, three to $6 million on a deep water AUV, and now you're dragging around a magnetometer, you know, five meters behind it. Um, as my, uh, one of my colleagues, a senior engineer, um, told me when we said, yeah, let's just drag a, you know, a, um, a cesium vapor magnetometer, uh, he, he um, in less polite terms, told me to go pound sand um, and just come back with a different idea. So that's why we, we did. And we developed a, a magnetometer that compensates for the vehicle uh, magnetics that are created by that vehicle, um, by its, its uh, static magnetic field, but also its dynamic magnetic field. So that, if you look in the top left corner, is what the magnetic map should look like. 
and does look like after compensation. And on the bottom right is an example. This is actually from an Ivor, not from a, a Hugen or Explorer, the bigger vehicles. This is from a little Ivor uh, and showing you that the, the data on the bottom right is, is basically not interpretable. Um, so this is, this is what spurred on our self-compensating magnetometer, which is a very popular product. We, we sell a lot of these. Uh, they typically go into AUVs although we have deployed them on ROVs. And recently we started putting them into USVs where they're going in the hull for shallow water uh, detection. I'm giving you this background just to kind of show you where HyperMag came from because um, the self-compensating magnetometer, the RM HyperMag is the, the next evolution of that, which is a much more sensitive magnetometer um, that, that we've designed. Um, and, and I will say this is early days for us. So it, it is based on equipment that we we already build and sell but this is a new kind of configuration and some slight differences to it uh it's actually going out for uh testing in the field um on land probably starting early april uh hope to be in the water uh with it um, but that's one of the nice things about magnetics as opposed to say our electromagnetic gear is you actually can test it all on land um so the idea be time behind hypermag is that you can deploy multiple magnetometers, um, so taking our SCM technology and deploying them uh, in an array that gives you a combined precision that is the same as a cesium vapor overhauser, the, the type of towed magnetometers that you're, uh, that you're used to. Uh, some of the advantages are actually probably better precision in some cases, uh, vector data, um, right? So you can actually point to, to where the anomalies are. Uh, lower system costs than, than the current systems. And from our side, maybe this less interest, but I, I will come back to it in the end. It does fit on our roadmap um, to a very, um, to, to an active system rather than just the passive, which is again, looping for us all the way back to the beginning um, where we started was developing active systems, but ROV based, based systems. An overview, um, of, of in, its, in its simplest form is each hypermag is composed of what we call a tile, multiple magnetometers. Um, by combining them, you improve the, the base sensor noise and get down to the sensitivity of um, uh, the, the, the kind of towed magnetometers that you're used to. The spacing between the elements um, can be designed for the application. So if you're interested in vertical gradients, if you're interested in horizontal, if you're interested in spread for, for um, you know, a width of multiple panels, if you're interested in a toad configuration, it's one of the nice um, parts about the HyperMag is the individual sensing units are, 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 are very small um, and you can tile them into multiple units to create very, very large arrays. So this is why we call it a scalable uh, vector gradiometer, right? Is, I've shown a couple of configurations there, but that that really should be based on your modeling of the type of signal you're trying to detect. Um, so some of the other features, you know, uh, kilohertz uh, bandwidth, uh, so so very fast sampling, and this is what I talked about leading into the future, going back, circling back to uh, active systems, uh, simple connectivity, Ethernet RS two thirty two, very low power. Um, so these systems don't have the, the same type of power draw, which makes them very amenable to um, AUVs uh, and low power systems. And also just even in a towed system, just requiring less power um, as you start, as the towed systems become more and more and more complicated with more and more instrumentation, uh, having a very low hotel load from our instrument um, is, is actually starts to become important. Uh, and some of the other options that are are being built into the first version, which is the the single tow body, are um, attitude, so an integrated IMU, uh, standard depth, altitude, and um, and a USB BL, BL res responder pass through. Um, in my next slide, I'll come to some of the reasons th that are important um, to have that information, which probably a lot of you are aware of, but I'll I'll, I'll just go over it. And obviously, this leverages our um, already existing uh, real-time magnetic data processing uh, expertise. So again, as a, you know, we, we've given it a different name, RM HyperMag, but really this is an evolution of our SCM. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that has a lot of systems out there in the field. 
So I said I was going to circle back to why all those things are important in terms of attitude, depth. You know, I've I've, I've put up there some some examples. Um, this is a uh, just taken from a public website, uh, Geometrics, giving some examples of um, you know, sorry, on the on the right hand side, different targets and their sizes and their magnetic signature. But I think it's really important to remember when we look at this that the magnetic signature of a seafloor object isn't um, just as remnant magnetization, right? It also matters what orientation it is in the Earth's field. So something, um, you could have the same object and depending on its orientation, it could have very different signals. So performance isn't just a function of sensitivity. Now, by having multiple vector measurements, both in terms of total field, uh, even from a single panel, uh, multiple gradients from a single panel, or now scaling that out to um, multiple panels, it, it gives you some real advantages. Um, uh, our, the, the previous presenter talked about you know, false positives um, and, and you know, having these thousands and thousands of targets. By having these additional measurements, so you're going to have the total field, which is you know the same as what you would get from a regular toad magnetometer, but now you have these other uh, vector measurements and you have multiple measurements. Is you can start to model and figure out what you know before you go out and do the survey. Um, you can go out and model and figure out what the response from those particular items of interest would be. Um, so yeah, Mr. Alman showed the gas canister um, in in the sea floor. Uh, you know, assuming it's steel, it's going to have a certain um, a certain um, response, and the more you the, the, having the multiple measurements, um, then will allow you to do some forward modeling, and you know you potentially could lower the number of false positives, but also you know from a, a survey efficiency point of view, it potentially gives you the opportunity to actually change the survey line spacing. Right, you may have the detectability for your objects of interest. Um, and this obviously drives the survey cost, right? If the, if the boat has to, you know, pull five meter lines with one and a half meter sensor spacing, and now all of a sudden you can pull that out to two meter sensor spacing or three, or, um, or you know, fly slightly higher um, so that you can tow a little faster um, and have less chance of, you know, running your active tow fish into the sea floor, things like that. It really starts to change it both from a survey planning and from an operations point of view. The the final note I have up there is better positioning. Um, and again, I'll, I'll come back to this, but if, you're, if your magnetic radiometer is towed on cables behind a tow fish, there's a certain error within your um, magnetic measurement. And this is because the closer you are to the magnetic source, the stronger your, your response is going to be. And this falls off as an inverse uh -oh, a cube function, I think. Um, so you can imagine if you have multiple magnetometers, they're all flying behind something and they're all going at slightly different heights or, you know, you go up and down, they, they, you don't know exactly where they are. Um, your, not your, your sensitivity of your interest, of your, of your instrument, but your, um, your sensitivity to the object of interest can change because you're actually going to get a map that starts now to have um, artifacts from acquiring the data at different heights. There's ways you can get around this by, you know, doing full inversions and things like this, but you do need to know where they are. So in our in, in our simplest form, uh, you know, having a USBL responder mode tightens up your ability um, to to position the the magnetometer as well. And when you start moving into a into a system that is, um, I apologize, I put these in the wrong order, um, is in a strap down configuration where it's tightly integrated with the vehicle, which has, you know, where everything is rigidly attached, you start really getting better positioning. Um, so these are a few different concepts. Um, the one on the bottom left is one of the ones that we're uh, be deploying first, but we're we're also, you know, very aggressively looking at integration onto active tow fish, such as the one on the top there, which is a an image of an uh, IVA scan fish. Um, does it does lend itself well to, you know, hovering AUVs um, and and ROVs for cable tracking? So, like I said, I apologize that these are a little bit I had that out of order there. Um, I think we all we all know this, right? If you have vector gradients and if you have vector um, 
uh, field measurements, also uh, uh, magnetic intensity measurements, now you can start to point to things with more accuracy. And again, as you make that array wider, um, there's ways that you can point to that. But even a, even a single magnetometer, you have the vector um, vector in a single RM hypermag panel. You have that vector information. So, um, you know, applications. Obviously, we're very interested in the in the in the UXO um, for this. Um, our little bit of activity in that is really pointed out that there's a, a huge opportunity here um, for uh, the RM hypermag system. Uh, both as you know, uh, towed uh, in the kind of the same configuration as a as a cesium vapor um, system, um, or in a uh, you know what we call strap down mode, where it's rigidly attached um, to the the uh, the um, the tow fish, and and I put that in a couple of slides before too. You know, you can you could deploy it in a two body tow configuration, or the configuration that, that I showed a couple of slides back was the um, what we call the X-wing um, configuration attached to the back of a side scan. So in the rapidly evolving world of USVs, um, you know, being able to rigidly attach your sensors to the uh, tow fish uh, starts to become really important just from an operations and, and uh, equipment handling point of view. A two-body tow, um, it, 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 it's not impossible. It just um, it, it may cause a little more complexity in your equipment handling on um, unmanned vessels. Um, pipeline survey. Uh, I th again, I think we're all familiar with these. I'm just kind of trying to show you some of the different applications, some of the different opportunities, um, you know, different, different configurations, ROV, uh, hovering AUV. Um, I haven't put up here, you know, a picture of our, our AUV, the, uh, the Hugen, but obviously on a, a torpedo uh, shaped Hugen um, or Explorer or Ivor, or, um, whatever, uh, whatever torpedo uh, style AUV, um, obviously possible too. Um, and, uh, and, and power cables. So, um, you know, difference in signal between power cables and communications cables is obviously going to be greatly different, but um, there's, there's opportunities opportunities there too. I will leave off with kind of a, I, I, I talked about moving towards applications, um, but I will lead off that this whole, or sorry, not lead off, I'll, I'll end off with uh, this whole idea that, you know, uh, electromagnetics is, is not just the magnetics part of it. There's other applications. Uh, I talked about ICP, which is our cathodic protection. That's an E-field system. And I think, you know, this, the development and deployment, and as we learn more and uh, different applications for for hypermag, we're going to also start seeing a lot of interesting applications for combining the two, um, especially in submarine cable monitoring and fault finding, uh, where now you're able to measure the E field, which you know our our ICP system is a proven commercial system. Couple that with the RM hypermag, which is the next evolution of another proven system. Really, it's all about about applications. So obviously. Um, and, and combining those can lead to some very powerful systems. Um, but uh, I think, you know, as per the, the, uh, the theme of this, this um, live stream, you know, UXO is kind of the, the, the starting point for us on this. And uh, we're, we're really looking forward to getting this out in the field and, uh, and uh, um, developing that, that, uh, that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. That was uh, that was really interesting, and um, I've got I've got I've got a couple of questions myself. And uh, again, you you may have to excuse my uh, my lack of knowledge. Um, so, what what size objects can you can you detect? Do you have to have a larger array to detect um, a different size object? Yeah. So I think every geophysicist just cringed to that question um, because it's it's a question we get asked a lot. And it's not really sorry to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not about boring. It's it, it's a very difficult question to ask uh, or to, to respond to. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the slide here mm. um, where we talk about um, um, the the um, detection ranges. As I mentioned, what happens is depending on the orientation your object is lying in the Earth's magnetic field, it has a different signature, right? 
So if you're looking for, um, you know, just a basic um, kind of detectability, uh, that chart on the right is 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 going to give it to you, right? And it's but you can't rely on that because it may actually be zero nanoteslas, right? Or there may be a you know a, a, a torpedo or a, a shell or something that that should have you know at um, I don't know what do we have here um, you know 0.5 nanoteslas at two meters that could actually be be 0 0.05 depending on its orientation. So this is why I was saying that you know a performance is not just a function of sensitivity, right? And having these other vector gradients now allows you to detect objects that might not be detectable with a total field magnetometer. Um, so that's a really long way of saying it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Uh, and you were, you were, you were show, you showed kind of different ways to kind of mount your array and, and you showed kind of some pictures of ROV and um, AUV, that type of thing. If I, if I, interpret your yeah. presentation correctly um does it does it matter which way the array is it, it is does it have to be perpendicular to the thing you're detecting or can yeah, it be in, I, li in line with the thing you're detecting so the answer again here is absolutely and de depending this is one of the advantages of hypermag is you could stack them vertically you can lay them horizontally mm -hmm. you can have horizontal and a vertical stack um, you know, there's lots of different orientations that you could um, that you could use for the system, right? So, you know, this one, this slide here is showing three panels arranged um, on the right hand side. They're showing three panels arranged um, in a on you know on edge, and the other one uh, in the X wing there is showing it um, uh, in in that direction. So, you know, the along track. Uh, it, be, because of the physics, you know, you can get the X, Y, Z gradients, and then you can actually calculate the inline. Sorry, you can get you can get two of those gradients, and then you can calculate the inline. Um, or if you want to measure it, you may have to go to something on the right, right? Because okay. your calculated gradient in the in the third dimension is going to be a, a function of the you know the error on that is going to be a function of the errors of the other ones. But um, that's one of the advantages is now you can now you can do the modeling. So we have lots of tools to do modeling to say this is the shape of the field you're trying to detect. This is the best way to do it. You know, we're interested in the Z gradient being the most sensitive, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, that's, that's really why I said sensitivity is not the only measure of performance, right? Mm -hmm. Is there's a, there's a lot you can do just through configuration um, and geometry that will improve your discrimination. Okay. Okay. Well, I think um, I think uh, that that's um, I think you, you without without uh, starting to teach me about um, about this science completely, we'll go on to ask uh, a few questions from our. Um, that's okay. You've, you've reached viewers. the limit. You've reached the limit of my knowledge. I have to refer. I'll, I'll have to bring on my colleagues if we want to go yeah, further. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, let's have a look what we've got. Um, so uh, we've got a question here. Do you need prior line calibration like the SCM that, in, that is installed on the AUV for this hypermag? Uh, there's two answers here. If you're just towing them in a towed configuration where you don't have the effects of the vehicle, uh, no, um, uh, not, not necessary. Um, because then you're using the systems in there without the influence of the vehicle. If you're towing them, um, like in the X-wing, if if that if that's that X-wing has two configurations, one where there's just a tow body, um, which is non-magnetic, it's just a magnetometer. Same way you would, you know, tow five meters behind a, a sub bottom or a side scan. If you're if you're uh, marrying that up right behind the vehicle, uh, yes, quite likely you need the SCM. And, and to be totally, the, 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 you'll need algorithms to, to do that. And to be totally transparent, um, you know, it's, it's quite unlikely you'll get the sensitivity that you do in a two-body tow when you bring it up and you apply the algorithms because now you're bringing in errors from the vehicle itself. But yes, both, both opportunities exist. Compensated attached to the vehicle or uncompensated in a, I'll call it standard uh, tow, uh, tow configuration. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thanks for your question there, Zufri. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Vern Nathan. Uh, he is asking if the X-Wing is fully integrated with the side scan with data and power fed through the same cable. Uh, we can. Um, it depends on the guest ports of the particular side scan, right? So our system is uh, Ethernet or RS-232. Um, but say if you're putting down a response, so so it, it's it it becomes a function of the guest ports. Similarly, if you want to add a responder mode, you know that's a path through. It starts adding other either a MUX or additional um, conductors. But if your side scan has a guest port that can support the Ethernet or RS-232 um, with a you know one watt of power, um, then you should be able to to do that. Okay, and uh, a quick, a quick, a question um, around the X-wing again from Matt Halson. Um Does the does the X-wing need to be uh, large to get sufficient differences in the gradients? Um, yeah, generally the answer is the larger the better. I believe that design that we've done for a client, I believe, has a seventy centimeter uh, center sensor to sensor across the diagonal. Um, but um, yeah, I'd have to, again, I'd have to ask one of my colleagues that there becomes a, a point um, where the, you know, the, I guess the, the gradient, if, if you get too big, depending on the, the shape of the gradient, you can start to mass the signal. But generally the answer is the wider, the, the, the wider, the better. Our, okay. our base design is one meter spacing, but this, this particular one for this client is, is, is I think 70 centimeters. Okay. Um, so I guess um, we've got a question from uh, Jeffrey Dingler. Uh, could you mount a unit in each hull of a catamaran to create a to create the gradiometer effect? Absolutely. So you could either mount um, you could either mount one sit like one panel with a couple of sensors in each catamaran, or you could mount two in two panels. You know, one in each hull. Or or four, you know, one at each end of each hole. Yeah. Or we'll we'll sell you ten if you want to put more in there. <laughs> if you want a giant <laughs> Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got a, a question from Ken Green. Um, effectively, he's asking, uh, how would you distinguish your product from a product such as uh, Innovatum's Smart Search? What what would be the difference, or how would you distinguish between yours and a, a, a similar product, if you like? Uh, yeah, so I, I think there's there's a few, right? Is it, it's the integration of multiple synchronized uh, vector magnetometers uh, running at a thousand hertz, right? So they have a, they have quite a high um, bandwidth, and then there's a you know in terms of some of the processing um, that we can then do with that. Uh, I think that just comes down to kind of some expertise within OFG for the integration of that data. But from a conceptual point of view, it's, it's a very, devil's always in the details, but it's a very simple system, right? As you're combining multiple vector gradiometers and synchronizing them across multiple units. Okay. Um, well, I think with that, for, we, we'd, uh, thanks guys for that, uh, for the questions there. And thank you, Matthew. Um, I guess the time's ticking along, so we better uh, thank you for my uh, ever so brief lesson there, Matthew. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for coming on to present such an interesting, uh, uh, on an interesting topic. So thanks very much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to hearing from uh, all our colleagues out there who are listening. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, so, okay, on to our um, final uh presentation this evening. Uh, we have two presenters this evening. Uh, we've Anne, we have Anne Chabert from uh, Fugro. She is the commercial manager uh, for geophysics for Fugro GB. And we have Martin Valk, who's the commercial manager at Fugro Netherlands. Uh, Anne is the commercial manager for the geophysical department at, in Fugro GB Marine. For the last eight years, she's mainly focused on geophysical and UXO surveys for the offshore wind sectors and previously worked at the uh, National Oceanographic Centre in Southampton as a postgraduate research assistant in marine geophysics. 
in the past eight years, she's worked for all the major players in the offshore survey sectors, including Orsted, Vattenfall, uh, Global Marine, EDF and Tenet. Uh, Martin is a business development manager, as I said, at Fugro, where he focuses on USO risk management. After graduating, he joined the offshore survey industry in 2009. He's held a wide variety of offshore and onshore survey roles at Periplus, Deep Ocean and Seaway 7. In the last four years, he's advised, tendered and executed risk mitigation projects in Europe. Um, and their joint presentation this evening uh, is entitled UXO Risk, Risk Mitigation, an Integrated Approach. Excuse me, my, the, the writing's so small on my auto cue here. Uh, I'm squinting a little bit. Hi, Anne. Hi, Martin. Good, good evening. Uh... So thanks for joining us this evening. Who have we got uh, kicking us off or are you doing a joint, uh, a joint effort? I will do the kickoff first, Simon. Okay then. Uh, thanks very much, guys, and uh, I'll uh, I'll hand over to you. Good. Thanks for the introduction. Good evening. Welcome to Fugro's presentation on UXO risk mitigation and integrated approach. I would like to thank the Hydrographic Society and its organizers for the opportunity to present here tonight. For the agenda of the evening, we've chosen to use the UXO risk mitigation framework. Uh, so the topics will be UXO risk assessment and mitigation strategy, whereby we determine the UXO risk and the scheduled mitigation measures. The next topic will be presented by Antje Baer, whereby she will discuss the UXO survey in an attempt to find potential UXOs. After that, I will take over again on the topic of UXO and the identification, which is the process of dredging the targets out in order to get a visual identification of potential UXOs. Finally, we'll conclude the evening with the topic of UXO clearance, which is basically removing or detonating confirmed UXOs in order to clear the project site. Like I said, the first topic is UXO risk assessment and mitigation strategy. The objective of the UXO historical desktop study is to determine if and what type of UXOs are present on the offshore site by studying the historical records about mine laying, bombing, airplane crashes, shipwrecks, dumping, and submarine activities. Next, it assesses the risk these UXOs pose to the project. The next slide is about geodata. Geodata can really provide great insight in where to look for UXOs in the seafloor. Basically, by understanding the soil conditions, we can say something about the historical seabed, the seabed dynamics, and the non-mobile reference layer, understand at what depth of burial the UXOs might be present. And by better understanding this anticipated depth of burial, we can optimize the survey design. For example, the survey design can be far more efficient if the justified depth of burial is just one and a half meters, as opposed to two meters, because you can use a wider line spacing or fly the fish slightly higher. Subsequently, all these insights are combined into a UXO risk mitigation strategy. It uses the UXO knowledge from the desktop study, the scheduled activities it combines it in a UXO risk matrix, and it recommends a UXO risk mitigation strategy, which often consists of a survey identification and clearance campaign. Next, it also defines the thresholds and types of UXOs to look for. This whole framework provides a clear roadmap for the project to obtain a LARP. Next, I'll give the word to Anne Chabert, who will talk you through the details of the UXO survey. I think you're still muted, Anne. The classic uh, little <laughs> cordon. So, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you come across. Thank you. Well now. Sorry about this. Um, yes, yeah, so you exo survey. Could you next slide, please? You have control. So I think the first um, the first point that I wanted to make about you exo survey is um, we need to. It's important to understand the objective of the you exo survey because one technical solution is not going to apply to all the surveys. For um, for example, here. 
if uh, there's an ex example of pre-construction uh, UXO survey where we have a jackup coming to site and we're just trying to clear for borehole. So we know the strategy is avoid. So in that case, we don't need um, we don't need high resolution data. We just need to have enough data so we can clear the specific um, location. But if we do a UXO survey for construction, where they're going to be a, a cable or foundation installation, then most likely we need to uh, cover the whole area and have really good um, resolution data. And really, it's important to understand that because that will drive the budget um, and the schedule of the UXO survey. So we always work to our client to first understand the objective of, of the survey. Um, next slide, please. In terms of equipment, the um, I mean, we've been covering that with Chris and, and Matthew, but uh, there are really three types of equipment we're using for UXO survey, which is magnetometer, so graduometer or magnetometers, either from the, a vessel or uh, land base or drone base as well when required. We have the size scan sonar that gives us the image of the seabed and we also use on some survey um, acoustic data to determine depth of burial and have a, a additional data to allow cross correlation with the mag. But here I'm going to focus mainly on, on uh, magnetometer and just give you a bit of a uh, of history I guess of um, of magnetometer to graduometer. So when I joined Figro about 10 years ago now we used to do a uh, mag survey with uh, soft toe magnetometers from the back of the vessel going up and down um, the um, this, the water column really and then we've moved to um, the scan fish Catria, and that's where in Fugo we started to think about graduometer and we developed the uh, Fugo Geoing, which has been now on the market for more than five years and has done multiple projects. And it's been very successful because, ha as we discussed previously, graduometer really brings something um, additional to the data. And then we also developed for the near shore element the uh, Fugo Mini Wing, which is just a small, a mini version of the, of the Geoing. And next slide, please. And the way it all started with graduate within within Fugro is we did this survey in 2014 in um, Guantimo using this small uh, TG, TVG frame and flying the TVG with a horizontal gradient near a turbine. And we just couldn't clear the location. So we just flipped the TVG to vertical gradient and we got amazing results. And I guess that was the, the moment where we're like, OK, this is this is the way we want to go. And really has shown that um, graduometer, especially the vertical gradient of um, of the cesium vapor mags we're using, is really helping to reduce background noise and um, ultimately the number of false positive and target to inspect. Um, so that's you know that's one of our uh, most common type of survey we use graduometer to do. Um, UXO survey. But one of the big questions we have is how do we optimize the survey parameters and how do we define our land spacing? Because land spacing is going to drive the schedule and the budget. So it's really a key element that we're trying to focus on uh, with our client to make sure we um, utilize the best uh, land spacing. And as Matthew described very well, there's no uh, linear relationship between uh, the magnetic anomaly and the uh, detection range because there's uh, many um, variables that can affect the magnetic response of a uh, buried UXO. So we try to look into it using different type of um, calculation and sources. So we looked at published data, mainly land, um, land uh, data. We looked at uh, forward modeling and but what we realize is within Figo, we've done so many UXO survey, we have a huge amount of, of data available when we do calibration on known targets. So we've used all those combined data to try to come up with, a, um, um, I guess, a, a relationship between detection range and the nano Tesla value. So just to give you an example on the next slide, um, is for 50 kilogram ferrous mass, we've plot all our 
seed surrogate item trials data that we had available, we uh, we plotted our um, uh, data from third parties, and we came up with a, a quite strong correlation between published data and data that we have that available. Now, now we can use to um, to measure, not to measure, but to uh, link detection range versus, uh, versus magnetic anomaly. So we can use that, and that is the next slide. Um, I'm not going to go into too much details, but basically, based on that, we can um, define our maximum sensor spacing, and we can define our best best line spacing. So we've really um, spent quite a lot of time and, and work and effort to try to work on this and try to provide the best service strategy for our clients. Um, and then next slide, please, is just the last slide on survey, just to show you that within Fugo, we can um, basically do the whole um, the whole survey from the offshore site to the cable to the land. And one thing we've been using quite a lot in the last couple of years is uh, drone uh, UXO survey that's been really successful. So we usually have a, a drone survey and then one of our initial vessel and one of our offshore vessel covering the entire um, survey area. And I think that's the last slide on survey. Good, thank so, you, Anne. Um, well, finishing the UXO survey, uh, the next topic is during the UXO identification. Again, this is the process whereby we identify the potential UXOs uh, that were found during the, the survey. Um, in some cases, in cases the, the final master target list of the survey indicates a large amount of deeply buried targets, a target reduction survey could be an option. This is also what Chris from Pangeo presented. Uh, you also see the, the same picture. Uh, the 3D sub bottom image provides the shape and size of the potential UXOs by looking into the seabed. And we use this data to determine if the object is above or below threshold. Everything below threshold is subsequently considered as non-UXO and left in situ. In the center image, you see the schematic of the RV, the SBI, and the, and the detailed survey. And on the right, you see the, the SBA, SBI data correlated to the technical dra drawing of the LMB. Uh, and this LMB was later positively identified by dredging it out as, as really an, uh, a confirmed uh, LMB. Um, so one, once that is done, basically, uh, this slide is about the various conditions we, uh, we anticipate. So offshore wind farms and their export cables cross a wide variety of water depths and mid ocean conditions. Um, I think we all know that ROVs typically struggle in, in shallow water, but also high current environments and large depth of burials may limit the feasibility of dredging and visual identification from a normal ROV. Um, therefore, during project preparation, it is recommended to look at different uh, water depths and mid ocean conditions. Um, so basically, for standard offshore operations, the work loss RV is definitely the right tool. However, if the current windows become smaller, a tracked RV can significantly increase the workability. For the nearshore and tidal areas, typically characterized by high current and also large depth of burial, we operate an integrated system, the SEAUG from a backhoe excavator. So how does the uh, typical UXO identification process work? Um, so basically, the following steps are considered. First, an S-found survey is performed using the TSS 440. Next, the work loss ROV gently excavates the target in a controlled manner. The target is identified by the UXO expert. And in case the target is identified to be a non-UXO, it will be removed. Finally, an S-left survey will be performed to confirm there's nothing underneath the target by, the, by a masking effect. If the target is, turns out to be a confirmed UXO, it will be part of the clearance operations. The same process is now also feasible with Fugro's C-AUG system, the, the integrated nearshore uh, UXO ID tool. Um, as mentioned earlier, the SEAUG is operated from a backhoe dredger and smartly integrates all sensors to do the UXO ID without recovery of the tool. So hereby, the, the backhoe dredger basically transfers to the location and deploys the spud legs and the SEAUG. Next, the S-found survey is performed using the TSS-660, and the target is excavated in a control manner. 
The tool also enables the option to remove large amounts of overburden by the high capacity dredge. Finally, the target is identified again by the UXO expert. In case the target is identified to be non-UXO, it will be removed and the next left will be performed. So on this slide, you see a positively identified uh, UXO. Starting with the magnoclation on the, on the left, you see the TSS440 uh, as found survey, and then the dredging commenced. Due to the low visibility, the target in this case was identified using the other sonar, which you see in the middle as a British MK70 contact mine. So the next topic is what to do with the confirmed UXO. UXO clearance. There are basically different ways to mitigate the risk of UXO. Depending on the state and type of UXO, geophysical and environmental conditions, there are different ways to mitigate it. You can avoid and reroute, relocate for disposal at the new location, or dispose in situ, which is the topic of today. To conclude the end of the presentation, this gives a high level impression of an in situ UXO disposal. First, the mine disposal system is prepared and installed on the RV by the supervision of the UXO supervisor. Next, the RV is launched and it sails towards the UXO, where the charge is precisely placed next to the UXO. Then the system is initiated and subsequently the charge is detonated, which triggers the detonation of the UXO. We can offer both high order and low order detonation. And finally, after the UXO is detonated, an as left survey is done. So this brings me to the end of the presentation and would welcome any question from the audience. Finally, thanks to the Hydrographic Society for the opportunity to present at this webinar. That was excellent. Thank you, uh, Martin and Anne. That was very interesting. And um, I see you've got um, quite a quite a few novel ways there of 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 transporting your equipment. You know, drones and vessels on a backhoe, etc. I'm just uh, just a couple of questions about the the drone, really. Um, now, now is that just for specific areas or specific shallow water? What situations would you nominally be using that in? So we use it where the vessel, the Nisha vessel, um, can't access. So um, is the intertidal area where a shallow draft vessel cannot access, and it is a very good solution for these very few meters between the land, the beach, and and the shallow water limits where we always mm -hmm. struggle. We, in the past, we had to wait for high tide, uh, the right window, the right high tide to do the to do the survey. So it's been very mm. efficient and is um, a lot less, uh, a lot more weather capable than our vessel. So it's, yeah, it's a very good solution for uh, those type of okay. area. So so the drone would kind of fly fly a line plan basically to cover yeah. that, to cover that area. Yeah. If, you know, the, the non-reachable area, I guess. Yes, exactly. Oh, well, okay. So how long a flight can you get out of it usually? Uh, they are much quicker than us. <laughs> that is the answer. <laughs> much quicker than a vessel, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they, yeah, I can't remember exactly the the speed, but they can do quite quite a lot. I think they're no, limited yeah. by the sensor. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, carrying the weight. How long, you know, before you have to come and change the battery or whatever? Oh, it's a uh, it's a day. It's a, um, they recharge okay, a battery yeah. at the end of the day, so it's quite yeah, efficient. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Okay, um, so you you again again. Um, okay, you 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 had started off earlier about you talking. Martin was talking about kind of compiling. Um, data from from you know previous data about um, where mines were laid etc cetera, etc cetera. is that kind of like a, a well you know a well trodden path or is it quite difficult to kind of dig your way through archives and stuff like that no I think think most most of the GS databases are well populated with with their data I think now as the offshore wind goes into the uh, the, the emerging markets uh, Taiwan the states um, I think we have to open new records basically to get uh, to get a clear insight in the UXO risks that are in yeah. those areas 
Yeah. Okay. So it's so I guess in more um, I guess more uh, where the wind where where offshore wind is more developed than the the uh, the the records are, are, are more commonplace and, and and easier to get hold of. But as you go to to different places in the world, you might start having to dig your way through um, to other types of records. I guess is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And, and those those records might not so be well documented as here in, in Europe. I think we, mm. we cracked the nut quite well, or, or a lot of companies have, a lot of UXO consultancy mm. companies have. Uh, I think in those emerging markets, it's uh, it's slightly more uh, more complex, but not, not undoable. Okay. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll move on to uh, some questions from our audience. And um, I'm hoping that they'll, they'll get something to, to, bamboo, to bamboozle you. And uh, give you a bit of a challenge. Um, <laughs> um, so, diddle -da, okay, we've got. Uh, okay, we've got Matt Halson. Uh, using SBP for depth of burial will require a tight line spacing. Do you do this post detection from the UXO survey? Okay, what's this? Okay, so the question is using Subbottom Profiler to determine depth of burial. Um, well, first, if, if it was related to the first slide where we use basically geodata to say something about the expected depth of burial, that's where we really use geoconsultancy. So we determine, for example, the non-mobile reference layer or a hard uh, and stiff layer where we say, well, it's very unlikely or impossible that the UXO have migrated by itself deeper than that uh, layer in the, in, in the soil, basically. Um, if it comes to estimating the depth of burial during the detailed survey, so with the Ponzio data, there we really use the, the 3D uh, sub-bottom imager. And then the alternative is, is I think, if ARM uses with a very tight line spacing, uh, the sub-bottom profiler to uh, to look for LMBs and, and other uh, UXOs. Yeah, so we normally, if we use a sub-bottom profiler, it's because it's um, the uh, non-ferrous uh, UXO that we're looking for, and we know Mike is not going to give the, the the outcome that we want. So if we have to use a subbottom profiler, yes, you're right. It's a very tight line spacing um, for UXO survey. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you, Matt, for that question. We've got a question from uh, Nikki Nichols in Ellen. I gather I missed a, a question from her earlier, so apologise for that, Nikki. Um, is the CR controlled in the same way as an ROV? Um, yeah, basically, yeah. We can we can copy almost all the movements we can do with uh, with the ROV as well. So, in terms of the of the line plan of the S left and the uh, the S found survey, but also to position it really uh, neatly to to start uh, the dredging process. Yeah, so it's very similar. But the main benefit is is that it's it's from operated from a very stable platform, so it doesn't have to fight the current all the time in order to stay on uh, on position. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so we've got a question here from Walter Jardine. Uh, how do you manage HSE slash insurance issues when excavating potential UXOs, which may be unstable, especially in shallow water, where host where the host vessel is close by or dredging system is expensive? Yeah, so I think a really important step of the HEC management is the fact that the UXO experts or the EUD managers um, are fully certified and upper operate under the legislation of the country, basically. Uh, so that's the first step. Then about um, insurance. Um, yeah, so for each, especially for the clearance operation as well, for each operation, we do a full risk assessment. And then we have to approach our insurance to ensure we have also coverage for this, this part of the work, basically. So that's an on, on case uh, basis. Um, the simple or the, the excavating and dredging, so the ID phase is, is covered by the, by the standard policy of our uh, insurer. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've got another question. We've got a question from uh, Zufre. Thank you. Um, he's been asking quite a few questions today, so we really appreciate that. Um, so he's thanking you, uh, Anne and uh, Martin, 
And uh, a question for Anne. Uh, what kind of deliverable uh, does a, U a client usually request for a UXO, geophysical UXO survey? And, and is that different from a, a, your usual geophysical survey? Um, no, it's it's similar, similar type of deliverables. Um, sometimes we provide in-house the ALARP certificate, uh, which are the uh, sign, sign of clearance to say we can proceed with the activity. So some clients are only interested in the ALARP sign-off, I guess. But um, in terms of how we process the data and how we deliver the data, it's um, very similar to a normal geophysical survey, really. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and a, I think it looks like a final question here from uh, Kevin Murray, who uh, who uh, who praises your presentation, guys. So uh, pray, fine praise from our audience members there. Um, so when you developed the Geo Wing, what main features did you incorporate to improve the system from your previous solutions? So the Geo Wing is now is five years old, six years old, and I guess the uh, the novelty at the time was the gradiometer having the cesium vapors in a in a gradiometer um, in a vertical gradient and horizontal gradient. Since then, we have increased the number of of uh, magnetometers than the Geowing can cope with. Five years ago, it was five mag now we can go up to 10 mags we have um, the 3d version now so better positioning of the geo wing um, so better line keeping of the uh, of the geo wing with the um, the flaps vertical and horizontal flaps and we have a, a little sister the uh, the mini wing as well that we can use in the near shore area um, so yeah that's the evolution of uh, of it. We are not, you know, as Fugo, we don't develop equipment. So we're really interested in um, Matthew and, and his new magnetometers. And we always are on the look for the next uh, uh, technological um, advancements, really. Oh, super. Well, thank you, uh, Kevin and Anne. That was um, a great presentation. Um, thank you to uh, all our presenters this evening. Uh, that would be, uh, we've had Chris, Matthew, Anne and Martin. Thanks again for your, for your time. And, uh, thank you for the questions from our, our audience here today. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed it and I'll let you all go and have your dinners now <laughs> because, uh, especially our friends, uh, in the Netherlands and our friends in Norway, um, I guess they'll be putting the kids to bed now and all that. <laughs> um, so thanks ever so much, guys. It's been it's been a real pleasure, and uh, we really we really do appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, so uh, it just leaves for me to say thank you and take care and farewell. Thank, thank you very you. much for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, have a nice evening. Thank you. Nice evening.